All right, so let's talk about the management of uh, atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. Um, you can kind of put it together from all of these risk factors that we've gone over. So I'm not gonna focus too much on this. Um, uh, this is stuff that's pretty much common sense. Um, just know that our role as the nurse is often um, like teaching and health promotion, setting realistic goals and, and like education and things like that, okay? Obviously, after everything we've talked about, we know that one of the biggest things we can do to decrease the risk is stop smoking. And again, uh, people who stop smoking will notice a difference very, very, very quickly. Um, moving on to diet, I'm not going to go through all of this. These are things that, um, yes, they do show up on tests, like having to know, you know, exactly how much uh, fiber you're supposed to take and what have you. Um, but I wouldn't go crazy trying to memorize all of this. Um, I think the idea of uh, kind of this down here is, is more important. Um, knowing which kinds of uh, fats and, and, you know, we, we know that, for example, polyunsaturated fats are going to be better than um, a saturated fat. And just having an idea of what saturate, what kinds of foods offer saturated fats and what kinds of foods are poly or monounsaturated. So, uh, you know, obviously, unfortunately, bacon, which is so, so yummy. <laughs> uh, dairy, fat, butter, cream cheese, sour cream, those kinds of fats are all going to be um, saturated. Um, egg yolk is a saturated fat. Um, and then your mono and poly unsaturated. Um, you've got your fish oils, your vegetable oils, avocado oils, olives, um, margarine, uh, pumpkin and sunflower seeds, fish and shellfish. So you just kind of have to go through there and make sure you have an idea of, you know, um, what kinds of foods have what kinds of fats. And after we went through all of that stuff on dyslipidemia, you shouldn't have, you know, a really hard time figuring out which one of these is more, um, is healthier. And then again, of course, exercise keeps your blood flowing, keeps, uh, you know, uh, decreases your risk of a thrombo, um, a thromboembolic event. Um, there are, uh, again, standards. One of the things, uh, like a 20 minute brisk walk five days a week. Um, there are different, so what I find is that there are different, like there's different advice in every textbook and in every, um, even every website, it's like different things. So you will be able to pick that out on a question because you all you really need to know is that you need to increase your exercise. You need to get some exercise, even if it's a brisk walk five times a week for 20 minutes. Um, that's really, really what's important to know. And then let's follow this little path of pills up here. Here we go. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, pharmacological methods of management. So these aren't actually, um, you know, they're actually not as complicated as some of the other uh, farm that we've had to kind of go through. Um, we talked here about dyslipidemia, went through it. We talked about, this is where we talked about the saturated and unsaturated fats, um, talked about creating a, a phenotyping and, cre and creating a lipid profile. Um, uh, treatment decisions uh, for high cholesterol. This is just kind of one of those like algorithms. You don't need to memorize this at all. Um, I think it's, it's just, it's a good idea to kind of know, okay, when do we, when do we give statins and when <clears throat> really the, the important thing to pull from this is that we're going to try lifestyle modifications first before we go in with some kind of, um, like lipid lowering medication. But again, I just, kind of put in here what cholesterol is, what it does. If you look here, you've got your, again, this is your cellular membrane, right? And you've got this bilayer of phospholipids. And so your cholesterols kind of, um, you know, they're part of that lipid wall. They're part of what allows, if you look here, <clears throat> you know, what creates uh, movement and allows for movement in and out of the cell. Um, sorry, my computer's freezing a little bit there. Uh, 
Um, and again, that, that cholesterol cannot travel through the blood to where it needs to go on its own. It needs to uh, be broken down into these little uh, lipoproteins in order to move through the blood. And so when we've talked about how dyslipidemia being really the highest uh, risk, right? So these are the, this is something that we, we want to uh, uh, address our treatment, right? This is where we want to address the, the management. And so yes, you can eat lower fat foods, you can eat lower, you know, all the dietary stuff and the exercise stuff we talked about. Um, but we also talked about um, these, these lipid lowering drugs. And so the really the main uh, lipid lowering drugs would be your statins. So it, they're really just called statins because they all end in statin. You simvastatin, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, lovastatin. These are your um, uh, Lipitor, Crestor, those are the name brands. And what these do is they actually inhibit or decrease the amount of cholesterol that your liver is, is creating. So remember I said that your, your body actually creates the amount of cholesterol that you need, but you're eating more. And so it's saying, well, then let's create less in the liver. So it will actually block uh, the enzyme that's responsible for synthesizing, um, synthesizing uh, cholesterol, which will decrease your, your, LDL. It has an effect on your uh, receptors as well. So it uh, increases the receptors um, for LDL and increases um, um, HDL production. I remember we said HDL is important because it's kind of what rids the body of the LDL. That's what carries it to the liver. So a medication that can decrease uh, lower density high lipoproteins and increase higher density um, is going to have a huge effect on the amount of lipoproteins that are building up or, or LDLs that are building up in the bloodstream, right? Um, an adverse effect liver damage, I find this really easy to remember because, you know, it's basically working in the liver. So, um, you know, possible um, um, damage to the liver. This rhabdomyolysis is, is fairly rare. Um, it, it's a side effect of a number of medications. Uh, basically what happens is that your, your muscle cells die and then some of the like contents of your muscle fibers are released into the bloodstream and they build up and cause like um, just issue, problems with muscle movement and what have you. Um, it's, again, it's fairly rare. It's not something that on an exam that you you know, you necessarily, you would need to focus on. It's more this liver damage that you would be um, concerned with. So if you have a question about, you know, a patient who's on statins, what kind of blood work should you monitor? Um, and it's a select all that apply. You know, you would definitely get the obvious ones like your lipids, a cholesterol, what have you, but you would wanna do um, liver function as well, your LFTs, um, just to keep an eye on. Uh, any damage it might be doing to the liver. And then um, this uh, cholestid, I don't see it as much, um, but what it does is it increases lipoprotein um, removal. And what that means is the, the LDL that does come back to the liver, some of it will be kind of repackaged and sent back out, but this um, cholestid will, will increase that um, uh, the amount of LDL that is actually just converted to bile acids and then, and then excreted through the biliary system, right? And so what happens is you have a decrease in that, uh, the, the amount of cholesterol and LDL that's being made in the liver. So not only are you getting rid of the LDL that's coming to the liver, but you're not using it to create more cholesterol that then that's going to be broken down into more LDL and sent out into the body, right? So it's kind of hitting uh, on two fronts. Um, really the only adverse effects that you need to worry about would be this GI symptoms, um, belching, heartburn, constipation, but these are symptoms that 
again, they're usually transient. They usually go away after a few weeks of being on the medications. By the way, all of these medications are medications that when you have coronary artery disease, you would need to be on them for life. Um, or at least, uh, you know, until your lipid profile, you know, actually you would need to stay on them. Sometimes what happens is people's lipid profiles get look good. And so they go off the statins and sometimes they can maintain that through diet, but most of the time they end up going back on the statins because it really is the statins that's helping them. Um, and then your antiplatelet drugs. So we're going to talk more about this when we cover stroke, but um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. Why would we use antiplatelet drugs for atherosclerosis when we're talking about, you know, lipids and cholesterol levels. Well, one of the biggest issues with atherosclerosis or, or risks is that thromb the, the, the growth of that thrombosis or thrombus, and then, you know, it breaking off um, and the, the risk of a thrombolytic event. These are huge, huge risks. This is, this is really what we are, the number one thing we are trying to prevent. Over here, we're trying to prevent it, sorry. Over here, we're trying to prevent it by stopping the growth of that fatty streak. We don't want those lipoproteins there to be able to turn into the fatty streak. Here, we're attacking it from the other end saying, okay, so wherever that fatty streak has formed or some of that you know, um, blood flow has been occluded, we want to make sure that one, no more thrombus or thrombi can form. Um, and two, the blood that is flowing through there is, is less likely to clot, right? And so um, one of the ways we do this is through low dose aspirin. And we talked about this when we talked about inflammation, about how the um, uh, aspirin is a COX-1 inhibitor. And so it's going to interrupt that uh, cyclooxygenase pathway, right? We talked over here, let me just see if I can find it, about these pathways. I'm sorry, they're still scribbled on from before. But um, right here, we talked about how when that collagen is exposed, that platelets start to adhere to the site and then they release this thromboxane and that thromboxane causes even more th platelet aggregation. So what we want to do, how is we want to stop this from happening? How does the body do this? Releases the thromboxane and so on. It does it through this cyclooxygenase pathway. So we want to stop that. So what we do is we stop the COX-1 um, enzyme that is here uh, breaking it down, breaking down the arachidonic acid into uh, thromboxane, which is going to cause platelet aggregation and, and uh, vasoconstriction. So when we take, um, sorry, antiplatelet drugs, uh, ASA really is, is really we're talking about aspirin in this one these should, this is something else um it's interrupting that that cyclooxygenase pathway okay always 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 a risk of bleeding with any antiplatelet anticoagulant and anything that is uh working against thrombo thrombolytic events or um, is going to increase your risk of bleeding um, and especially with um, aspirin is a GI bleed, uh, GI ulcerations. These are, you're just at much higher risk for those. And then one of the other, so oftentimes people who are at a very high risk will be on baby aspirin a day. So 81 milligrams a day. And then um, also on a low dose of, of uh, another antiplatelet, um, uh, clopidogrel or tecagrelor. Um, these are kind of your other, they work in a different way, but they're doing basically the same thing. They're interrupting that pathway. So clopidogrel and tecagrelor um, inhibit, ah, here is that, that glycoprotein 2B and 3A that we were talking about earlier. So remember when we talked about, oops, sorry, I just got to go fast up here. When we talked about over here, how do we stop these platelets 
from clumping together. Well, ticagrelor and clopidogrel will actually um, block these receptors. And these receptors are important because I know we talked about this already, but we're going to repeat it. Um, they are what the fibrinogen will kind of latch onto in order to clump or, or stick together all of those platelets. So these medications actually interrupt that, um, interrupt the cascade at that point. So if you look here at the kind of cascades that we, oh, they're so messy, I'm sorry but we talked about aspirin kind of blocking it right here, right? Um, clopidogrel will actually um, stop it more here, right? So, so it's stopping those platelets from adhering in the first place. Um, and it also will have effect, I mean, on when you get to the end of the, the clotting cascade, um, you'll see here that we need the fibrinogen to make fibrin. Um, so if we're, you know, affecting the amount of fibrinogen that's being used, that's going to have an effect as well. Right. Um, okay. So I just want to go over here. I think that's our last medication again. So really it inhibits platelet aggregation. Honestly, it doesn't matter where in that path it's doing that. It doesn't matter. Um, sure. You can, you can remember glycoprotein 2A and 3B. I, I would, be really impressed if that popped up on a test. Um, but the idea is that it inhibits that platelet aggregation. And this one inhibits the cyclooxygenase pathway, passageway, sorry, pathway, your aspirin. Those are really our two um, main kind of, yeah, uh, main kind of uh, like blood thinning management. Um, so I will post this a giant kind of <laughs> mind map that I've made that it's, it will have less scribbles on it when I post it, I promise, um, for you to use to study. Um, and I should have some study notes made within the next couple of weeks as well. So hopefully that helps. This, this unit is really, really um, intense, I guess. Uh, it has a lot, a lot of different things to think about, but um, I think I've highlighted the main things that you really, really need to understand. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can email me again, it's Lauren at learningwithlulu.com. So you can email me there. Otherwise, uh, we will see you next week when we talk about stroke.